This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. Today we're going to go all the way to Carroll, Michigan, where we attended the best interest of the summit. And um, way back in February 11th of 2011, we had the opportunity to make meet a mayor rehab and she told us of a shocking story a mayor's infant son Samuel fell in the bathtub and died from a fractured skull what followed is a confluence of cracks in the systems justice medical and social each one the emirs feeling painfully through a jury eventually found rehab innocent in 1986, but it was too late in the eyes of the state, and there were lingering doubts. The death certificate still listed his cause of death as a homicide, and the children remained in foster care. But that was only the start of the struggle. The emirs continually tried to get their children back, but at every turn they met a dead end and more opposition. One judge agreed to restore parental rights, but only if rehab admitted a killing her little son, Samuel, and began attending therapy. The emirs refused. Here is their story. She said, you're 
your daughter, your, your son, my two-year-old, where we started being in the system, who died from an accidental fall. The state knew that my son had a brittle bone disease. The Wayne County Medical Examiner Office destroyed my son's autopsy records. I was charged two months later of killing my son. The medical examiner of Wayne County testified before a jury back in 1986. I was acquitted by his own testimony 15 minutes after he testified. He said that my son's injury, there is no way it could have happened, it's just a, a fall, accidental fall in a bathtub. He's not given a hypothetical theory. My son did not have a scratch on him, didn't have a bruise on him, didn't have anything to find out later after my acquittal. I should have gotten my kids back and then the state, I sh they said, no, you should not have your kids back until you admit you killed your son. I refused. Then I had a child four months later. They stole her, kidnapped her from the hospital at one day old. To find out later after, after all of this going, 10 years later, losing all my rights because I did not admit killing my son. We have evidence that the state conspired with the therapist, with anybody, to, they want them to say that we're unfit. Those people testified that not even one person said that we're unfit. My children were brainwashed to believe that their brother was killed by me and the state had to protect them to be taken away. We went through the appeal, we fought day and night what my children, their cries, their voice were stripped away. I promised him. I said, no matter what and how long it's going to take. Mom and Daddy was going to make sure your voice is going to get heard. <laughs> Ten years later, Watching uh, Kelly and Company a few back in the back in the 90s, when I saw a family going through the same thing of us, their child had a, a brittle bone disease, copper deficiency, went through the same thing as of my my twin son. We got hold of them, we got their uh, their contacts, while us as a parent were prevented to get any records from the hospitals or anything. This parent, who is not a relative, who doesn't know anything, just called in the hospital, said, do you have a record on our children? They said, yes. He called me up and he says, we have, just go, then tell them that your name is, we have Amen. Give those records. I went to children's hospitals, to open hospitals. I got records on my kids except the skull, the skull x-ray that we indicate of the fracture. that those records went to a world-renowned expert that clearly stated that Samir, my son, had a brittle bone disease. Not only that, my son was tested, and the test came positive. The state workers prevented us from getting those results. Even when I asked, I want my baby, when she was born, I want her to be tested, even they prevented the doctors, the hospital, to have my baby to be tested for brittle bone disease. Now we have evidence to prove that my son had a brittle bone disease, and that's how the medical examiner could not clearly justify his classification for homicide when there is no physical evidence or trauma, internal or external, to the body to say that this is what a force, a blunt force. Now we'll go back to the court in 1995, 1996. Before Judge Amy Hathaway, she overlooked our evidence and she said we have overwhelming evidence to believe that Samir had a brittle bone disease. The state, the prosecutor, the Department of Social Service claimed that your honor, it's not in the best interest of the children to believe other than what we told them because we took them to therapy for over seven years to believe that their mother had killed their brother. So it's in their best interest to believe that their brother was killed because they live fine right now and happy. If you tell them otherwise, they won't have a trust in the system. <laughs> I mean, how could we, how as a parent, clearly believe any child 
has interest to believe that your brother was killed. I, I thought it was in my children's best interest to grow up with me. Believing I killed your brother when that judge ordered me. She said, we have to say that you killed your son. You have your three children, two year old, five year old, and six year old. Outside that courtroom, you will get him. I was 20 years old. I said, I fear only one judge. She said, yes, I am. I said, no. I said, a judge, God, the creator of heaven and earth, who witnessed me, who is my judge. I'm not going to have my children under the circumstances that to, for me to raise them and to, for them to grow up with fear of me. They won't be in the, my children's best interest. And now my children brainwashed to believe that their brother was killed and that was in their best interest not to know the truth. Even though Judge Amy Hathaway disagreed with their analogy, but they told her, Your Honor, you cannot reopen the case. You have no jurisdiction because our kids were adopted. I said, what is the adoption has to do with justice? Those, my children, they need to be set free. They have a right to have a normal life, whether they are with me or with anybody else's. You cannot sentence my children to a lifetime of nightmare and believe it's in their best interest as a parent. I don't believe that's in a child's and a child's best interest to believe and to go through a a long life of nightmare. And we, we lost all our legal rights to win our kids back because of so-called adoption. I was told when they were 18, we can at least get to see them. And out of a sudden, the media, our case was uh, national, nationwide, high profile. And I started getting calls from people who were about my children, teachers, uh, neighbors, uh, how my children are being abused at that home, how they are afraid to be outside. They were told that if you show your out, being outside, that your parents is gonna come and kill you the way they killed your brother. Uh, I just said, the work needs to be done. When my son turned 18, I got uh, through a friend, a teacher, uh, sent him a calling card, birthday card, and a pictures of all of our visits with our kids to remember us. Instead of my son calling me, a sheriff from Oakland County called me and wanted to arrest me for seven pictures from so my kids won't forget, forget me or their dad and we just want them to know the truth. The media got hold of it and they spoke with the sheriff and, and they said, yeah, because the foster adopted mother, she doesn't want the family to have anything to do with them. They said, well, the child is 18 years old and has a right to know his family. But by then, my, my children are brainwashed to believe that God saved them. It was in their best interest to be what they had. Then my twin daughter, the second one, I saw her in 2001, then because of the media pressure, we were allowed to see our kids. By God's grace, my children remembered me. My baby I saw her when she was two years old, the last time I saw her, this time she was 15 years old. And she didn't remember me. At the same time, she was afraid. Then visits were cut. It's like you go back and forth in the system. And then my twin daughter said to me that she would never get on with her life until she dies and goes to heaven. And me and her twin brother to tell her what really had happened to her. Because her adopted mother put a question in her head that you were never going to know the truth until you meet your brother. Because the idea of brittle bone disease, it, that it did not, the foster adult mother, she did not accept it. And when my kids accepted it, she put this in her head, so my children now, they're not accepting it. Back in 2002, I told my husband, you know, we need to do something. 
really something? Why is it you question that why his records are missing? Why is the skull x-ray that that states that my son's injury was so severely it's it's missing? It's why is it the medical examiners Wayne County destroyed my son's autopsy records? What what's there that they don't want us to find out. You know, it doesn't make any sense and, and it doesn't need an expert for you to know there's something is wrong with, with that picture. Then I have we exhausted all of our legal means to go back to court. I called attorneys to see if I have a I need a court order or something to exhume my son's body after being after burying him for seventeen years. She says we have you have to get a, a or, or she gave me a run on run. I said, you know, and then I went and took another step to call uh, the funeral home, the director. And then he says, we have, your son had died. You buried him 17 years ago. Why do you need to do this? I said, my kids. I said, they need to be sacrificed. I said, those people destroyed the records. I believe in a higher power who preserves and we'll send a message. It took, you know, it took a, a, a permit, a simple permit, and a pathologist who's willing, a medical examiner, to test and exhume my son's body. I remember Dr. Warner Spitz. Dr. Warner Spitz, he, he told me, we have, your son was only two years old. You're not gonna find nothing. I said, are you willing? And I have my son exhumed to look at my son. Because I have a feeling that whatever it, the hospitals, Wayne County Medical destroyed, God would preserve. He agreed. We got a permit. On September the 17th of 2002, I and my husband and the three funeral directors went. We exhumed our son. My son was preserved. To speak out and to cry from the grave for every child out there. He cried for his twin sister. He cried for his brothers and my younger daughter. He cried for me. Let the whole world that I did not harm myself. <laughs> when the state took away my children's innocence and their voice, I became their voice. And my voice and my cries were never heard. God preserved my son, my beloved Samir. He was examined and preserved, and to find out it was a hairline fracture, it could never happen other than an accidental fall, and because of his brutal bone disease. The state knew that. Why did they destroy my children and so many other kids out there just for the sake of a mistake? A child has, is a human being, it's not a piece of object to remove from a loving family and to expect him to be okay and to brain, brainwash them to believe abuse is God's love. My children were abused and they told it because God loved you. Now my, now my children, two of my daughters are still brainwashed, not accepting the fact. My older son, he stopped coming around to believe. He stopped remembering things, says, Mom, they kept telling me that you murdered my brother. Somehow in my heart, I could not believe it, but they got me to fear you. Then we went back to the court. By God's grace, after 22 years later, my son's death certificate got amended to state his, class, his death was classified accidental. <laughs> <laughs> After 22 years later, Judge Edward Thomas, he said he's been in the, in the court as a judge for 27 years. He said he hasn't seen a case like the Armour's. It was literally misconduct of injustice that they made kidnapping, they legalized kidnapping when it came into my kids. He, he told me if your children were really 
under the age 18 that he himself would go get my kids. But they're adults, it's on their own, it has to be the choice. Yeah. Then with the death certificate being amended to say it wasn't it was an accident that that did not bring my kids home, nor they accepted the fact that this is the, the, uh, the, the truth. So we know our kids were brainwashed. Sierra and I interviewed with my kids. John Manny called me and he says, we have the truth in our brainwash. And I told my husband, with all of what we've gone through, maybe we need to do something. What? else do we need? I said, I don't know. Our baby wasn't preserved for nothing. My kids, they're not afraid. But by God's grace, I would never, with his guidance and help, have another child, faith, be put and sentenced as of my children. With lots of prayers and sleepless nights, I and my husband sat down, we drafted the legislature of the Amar Bill. I put down everything, what, what, what happened within the laws and what did not happen, what I think as a parent for child pastors, there is no laws that protect our kids. Their law protects criminals. Their laws that protects abusers, but to protect the innocence of our kids, they have no voice, no rights and they can, they're not allowed to be heard. In 2005, we drafted the legislature. We stuck with it for five years. Everyone said it never gonna go through. I said it will go through. Because a message from above, by preserving my son, there's a, that a message says that to preserve all other innocents out there. We took that and we fought it <coughs> till December the 14th of 2010. Jennifer Granholm signed it into a law where a child is being taken away from their parents. The priority is placed with their familiar center surroundings to protect all fundamental rights of all faith. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, a child's identity has a right to be intact. No one has a right to strip that child's rights away. He has a voice, and he has a right, and for sure, those rights need to be preserved. And now I can say to my beloved son, Hush, little baby, don't you cry. Mama, Papa, don't you cry. May you rest in peace in the of my precious angel. Your voice has touched every child out there. Pray to God the Almighty that touches your senses and your brothers to know that God is, is all about, about love, not uh, about abuse. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you with all what you want to do. Thank you so much for presenting. It was a very painful listening to this uh, story being told by Amir Rehab. Uh, through this became the Amir Bill, which actually is known as the Kenship Bill. It's where the state of Michigan is supposed to put foster children in Ken relative care. Unfortunately, the teeth of this bill wasn't strong enough as we are seeing that the state is continually not putting these children in the care of grandparents or other relatives. So we're working very hard to get this to change. I want to thank you all for coming and enjoying the program this evening. Um, I want to make a quick note of how you can help. You can um, join our network at miparentalrights.ning.com. 
That's miparentalrights.ning.com. We are becoming a very strong voice in the state of Michigan. We have to let these legislators know that it's time that we change and reform these child welfare laws. We also have a email address that you can email us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. Until next week, remember, your voice can make the difference. Hello, I'm a child protective worker. Check, check, check. One, two. Yeah. Come to you. So searching, looking deep inside of every person, working extra hard, keep it certain. Energy to remedy the hurting. The poetry is what I'm dispersing, reversing all the negativity, animosity, never stopping me. So searching, for beyond the people.